thank you all for coming back after lunch. Um, as Chris mentioned, my name is Megan. I am a soon-to-be graduate of the University of Waterloo. And I first came to Waterloo because I was really interested in studying tourism. And not in the sense of learning how to run a hotel or do tourism marketing. I wanted to learn how tourism changes people, how when cultures and people come together in those tourism pathways, what happens? How do those things get transformed? Uh, and in order to help me understand this, I use post-colonial theory in my work. And I'll come back to that. But for the moment, I want you all to pause. Whoa, I got to the end. <laughs> there we go. Um, I want you all to pause and think about, um, sorry, it's all over the place now. Just gonna go there. Um, think about what it would be like to vacation in Africa. If this is not somewhere you've ever been, think about what that might look like. What images immediately pop into your mind? What are the people like? So we're gonna come back to that. But first I wanna share a brief story uh, written by David Foster Wallace, in which two little fish swimming along and they come across an elder fish and the elder fish yells out, how's the water boys? And they swim on a little bit further and then the one fish turns to the other and says, what the hell is water? <laughs> Post-colonial theory is a way of helping us to see the water. We are all of us at the center of our own universes and we rarely pause to think about the fact that our way of understanding and perceiving the world is only one of a myriad of possibilities. Post-colonial theory says that colonialism had a tremendous effect on societies all around the world, and that our ways of understanding and perceiving one another and other places are still deeply embedded in those colonial ways of thinking and knowing. Colonialism is founded upon the creation of the us and the other. And if you're a colonialist, the us is civilized, educated, technological, spiritually enlightened. The other becomes, um, becomes created in opposition to us. So the other becomes uncivilized, uneducated, and in need of saving. This is what made colonialism possible. This is what justified forcibly removing people from their land, sending people to school to civilize them, and excluding them from every area of civil life. But post-colonialism is not some dusty exploration of past wrongs. It's a theory that helps us to understand the ways in which we continue to other people in our everyday lives. So think back to your impressions of traveling to Africa. Now, take a moment and think about what you know to be true about rural people, or urban people, or maritimers. My point is not that maritimers are somehow weird. My point is that we all of us construct these ideas about the other based on what we know to be true about us. So my big idea is how can we do tourism differently so that it allows us to break down some of these barriers that exist between us and them? So on to my first slide, which I've already displayed for the last five minutes. Um, I study slum tourism which sounds like it should be an oxymoron, but it's actually increasingly in practice in the mega cities of the global south, including Rio de Janeiro, Cape Town, and Mumbai, among many others. When I first heard of this, I thought, well, that can't be right. You can't have the wealthiest, most privileged people in the world traveling into the spaces of the poorest for fun and for tourism. People who are proponents of this form of tourism will tell you that it brings money directly into the hands of the urban poor, and that it allows tourists to get a sense of the real city that they're visiting. But my, my sense was that there was still something wrong with this, that this was still somehow embedded in voyeurism and the exploitation of the poor. So what I really wanted to do was travel to these slum communities and ask the residents what they thought about these tourists and their cameras. So I did my research in the townships of South Africa uh, in order to understand what townships are, you need to know a little bit about their history, which is rooted in apartheid. Apartheid is an Afrikaans word that means aparthood, and it was the official policy of racial segregation of the white South African government beginning in 1948. Under apartheid, uh, black South Africans were mandated that they could only live in these racially segregated neighborhoods known as townships. Their movement was heavily restricted, and they were forced to carry government-issued passes in order to be able to leave the townships. And the townships themselves were heavily barriered with only one road leading in and out so that the government could control the movement of the residents. 
These oppressive and dehumanizing acts of the apartheid government led to widespread protests and violent repression on behalf of the government, including the 27-year incarceration of Nelson Mandela. And the international community boycotted South Africa and demanded an end to apartheid, but many township residents weren't aware of this international support, so they still felt very alone and isolated in their struggle. Um, when I first came to South Africa in 2016, it was 22 years after the end of apartheid, and townships continued to be racially segregated neighborhoods, they continued to be geographically isolated, and have inadequate infrastructure, and were also um, physically very unsafe. Um, but at the same time, it's important to remember that these are also communities where families have lived for generations, they have schools, they have churches, they have football fields, they have community halls, so there's a whole, there's a community here, it's not just about poverty. Um, so, what I wanted to study was what people who lived in these neighborhoods thought about these tourists coming in with their cameras, taking pictures, asking questions about how they live. I wanted to flip the tourist lens to see the tourism experience from the other side of the camera. So I gave a number of township residents digital cameras and asked them to take pictures of what tourism looks like and what tourism should look like in their communities. And I kept, in my interviews, I kept waiting for the stories about how tourists are so annoying and so obnoxious and so rude and so demanding. Because after all, we're talking about people who, who were violently and systemically oppressed by, for nearly 350 years by people who look exactly like the tourists who are now coming in to see them. Instead, person after person told me how much they appreciated the tourists coming in to see them, how it gave them an opportunity to share their stories and in turn learn something new about other cultures as well. Many people told me that uh, these tours provided opportunities for white and black people to come together and interact with one another, which is something that wouldn't happen otherwise for very, very many township residents, in addition to having been illegal under apartheid. And several people told me that um, children in the townships are now growing up not to fear white people, because now they can run to them, they can kick a ball around with them. So through all of these encounters, these tours are perceived as helping to heal the wounds of the past, in the words of one participant, allowing people to come together and embrace in their shared humanity. So it all sounds pretty idyllic, doesn't it? I'd like to share with you a brief audio clip from one participant explaining to me how some people in the townships may perceive these relationships with the tourists. Um, the audio is laid over the possibly the worst video ever made that I took out of a car window at dusk. Um, but I really wanted to juxtapose the white spaces of town with the township as he explains his story. Is it your sense that people who live in those neighborhoods that are not being visited by tours would want tourists to come there? Even if they don't stand to benefit? Definitely. Yeah. Definitely. I think the, the idea that a person that I see as a superior person or a person that is better than me, the, the, the idea that a person like that can come and walk in the same street as I live makes me, even if there's no money, mm. it does something for my self-esteem. Who is, who is the person that is better? Mm. A white person. Really? Yeah. Why is that? Well, white people are better than black people. Well, but they're not. Like, is that the, I know the that. consensus? I know that. Okay, that kind of makes me want to cry a little bit. I know that, but the rest of the people don't look at them like that. Yikes. The person looks at you, you are white, they know that you have something that they don't have. You're much better than them. You know, financially, you know, their life is more together than mine. You, you have, have had a better life. You grew up in a house. I've never seen a house. I've always grown up in a shack that, that always licks every single day. Yeah. I, I'm, we have a single parent, whereas white people have two parents. I know I've never seen the inside of a car, whereas for a white person, a car is something that is like nothing. You know, I've never had enough money to buy enough school uniform to go to school. Right. I walk to school bare feet most of the time with torn trousers where the white person has never seen something like that. Yeah. So for that person to be able to come and walk in the street that I'm walking and be able to hold my hand and, 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 and be able to come into my place, 
before he even or she even gives me money, that is means so much for me. Really? No, it, 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 it means a lot. Why? What does it mean? I, I, I'm trying to understand this because I'm, you know, I'm an outsider and I'm a white person, so I, what does that mean? It means, it means, I'm a person too. Wow. It means. That's really heavy. People, people don't look at me the way I look at myself. It means some people realize that I exist in this world. Okay. People just by coming to see where you live. Coming to see where I live, they they and they can talk to me. Yeah. Because I grew up not knowing how to talk properly to a white person. You know that these people are actually even making an effort to recognize that I even am alive. You know is 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 a huge thing. You know. You know that that now these kids that we have now know what a white person is because they can run to them yeah. whereas I grew up not even being able to talk to a white person. Sure. So so it's, it's that 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 that, that, affirm, that self affirmation and confirmation of existence that comes with it as well. Wow. I talk a lot, don't I? No, but I mean you're really obviously moving me very much with what you're saying. Um and again like I'm a total outsider to what it's like Pretty abrupt stop there. Technologically, I'm not great. Um, <laughs> but obviously, this is just one person's perspective. This is not meant in any way to speak for what all township or even most township residents think. But it is interesting in that it shines some light on the complex nature of race in South Africa, in that the presence of these white tourists is valued because it's perceived as breaking down the barriers between white and black people. But at the same time, it's desirable because it is a white presence. This man went on to tell me that township residents are actually coming to value and see beauty in the townships because the tourists see beauty in them, which is a process that he described as reconscientization, which is a word I can't say. Um, I've really struggled with how to discuss the fact of a black South African man telling a white Canadian woman that white people are better than black people. Um, this is why context is so important. Um, Post-colonial scholars, uh, especially Franz Fanon and Atelier Mbembe, write about internalized colonialism as the process of coming to perceive oneself as through the eyes of the colonizer, as being the most insidious impact of colonialism and possibly the most difficult to dislodge. My friend in this video is talking about internalized colonialism, but he's also talking about how coming together across racial lines is helping to break down some of that. So let's come back to this notion of big ideas. Um, first, I have a little big idea. I think everyone in this room at some point in their lives is going to be a tourist. Many of us will travel to the countries of the global south whose GDPs are much lower than our own. So my question is, how can we do tourism better so that it brings us together and helps us to learn about one another's lives rather than highlighting those things that differentiate and divide us. One participant in this research uh, made a comment that really stuck with me. He said, tourists, they think the experience is all about them. They have no idea that one person, one child's life can be changed forever in that moment of encounter. How might we do that moment of encounter differently if we knew that it had the ability to change a person's life? So then what about my bigger idea? What does any of this have to do with any of us who might not ever travel to South Africa or do anything that resembles a slum tour? Here's my thought. We are all of us inheritors of colonial legacies. At birth, some of us come to benefit from those legacies and others continue to be oppressed by them. How can we use something like tourism to begin breaking down some of those colonial barriers that separate and divide us? The people in my research had a desire to share their stories, stories that until very recently were not even acknowledged to be part of South African history. How might we understand our own national history differently if we were able to hear it from the perspectives of the people who haven't been permitted to write the history books or develop our educational curriculum or implement government policies? The people in this research had a desire to connect they wanted to share their stories. Having people come to visit them meant that they were seen where previously they had been invisible. Tourism has the potential to re-other people, to historicize people, 
to infantilize or fetishize or exoticize people. Our other option is to put the camera down and actually get to know people, talk to them. I think we all can agree that we're increasingly living in a world where creating barriers between us and them is becoming politics as usual. We are all of us better than that. Take risks, take time, get to know people in your travels, and in that instant, in that momentary encounter, think about how you are choosing to break down these barriers in the world. Thank you.